so. Okay. Welcome everybody. Just getting organized here. Your coffee will be ready in a second. It's all going. Mr. P is hungry. Uh, Well, there we go. Thingy over here, so Daddy can. Oh, don't get your coffee. Okay. Here I can get it. Okay. I don't I think want we're ready. To hit it. All right, we're gonna give uh, everybody a second here to get caught up. I know. Oh. Add place first here, and then, and then you get to join the live stream. Mm -hmm. you take it, dude. You yeah. take it. You're being too lazy. A few of them are just on the ground. So. so it is finally not winter. Though last it night did. at like two in the morning, my like alert alarm went off on my phone because there was a frost warning. Yeah, I got cold last <laughs> night, but we had two or three really hot days there. So really warm. again, the last frost date is just a suggestion, and it's always better to delay mm -hmm. than it is to have to run out there in your <laughs> run out there in your undies putting tarps over everything at two in the morning. So. So we have not planted our main garden yet. We have our greenhouse planted, but um, greenhouse, I have a couple. It, oh, well, I do have a sp an early spring garden, but those are frost hardy things like potatoes. But I haven't planted like my tomatoes and my green beans and my peppers. Excuse me, they're still, their starts are still in the greenhouse. And I'm going to give it a good num another week until I get brave enough to move them outside. Good morning, or good evening, Grammy. 77. That's nice. It's like North Carolina. 60 nice. something today, but. Nice and toasty. But what did you do today, Sam? I did statistics homework uh, and a little bit of pathophysiology. Took a statistics test. I think I did really well on it. That's good. It is good. Feeling smart? Yeah, well, so. I don't know about that, but. <laughs> Good morning, or good, I keep saying good morning, because it's so bright out. Good evening, Veronica, and Gathered Together, and Homestead Nana, thanks so much to, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about our favorite homestead hacks tonight, and a hack, I guess I'll define that as something that makes your life easier and gets something done faster, or something that saves you money. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that? That sounds so, good. So, we've been on the homestead for six years now, and I think we've... It's given us the opportunity to figure out some ways of doing things um, to make life a little bit easier, a little less expensive. So, so we got a uh, hello from Oklahoma. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, and hello from Ohio. Rained and dropped from 72 <laughs> yeah. to 58. Oh, no. <laughs> That's no fun. And good evening from Excelsior Springs. Thank you, Melissa. Was that by Kansas City? Yeah, it's a in that direction. So, and hello, Blessed Mama. Thanks for joining us. You little stinker. Look at you. So we made lists because we can't remember anything anymore, right? Yep. <laughs> hey, it's Tara. Patton says hi. Says hi, <laughs> Noah. <laughs> um, uh, so we made lists. So I don't know where you want to start. We got a whole bunch of stuff. We got kitchen. We got kids stuff. We got animal stuff. We got garden stuff. And I'm sure we'll think of other things. We can just bounce back and forth maybe. Yeah. And if you're listening and you have a hack for something that we're talking about that we haven't thought of, please do share because we enjoy anything that makes life work a little bit more smoothly on the homestead and learning from others. So, um, do you want to start? You want me to start? Uh, yeah, I can start. Uh, <clears throat> so this is this has to do with all the animals, but this stressed me out a little bit at first when we, we got animals. Because everybody tells you exactly what you're supposed to feed them and you know you do want to at least i wanted to try and feed them the best that we could and so you know i went out of my way to try and find certain types of feed and certain uh, brands of feed to try and make sure everything was organic and it was a headache like at the beginning um with i mean actually with both our goats and our chickens there were times where we would drive like three hours to find feed or two hours to find feed, I guess. I don't want to exaggerate too much. No, I'm and that's and that's okay. <laughs> Driving that far is okay, if you have a thousand chickens to feed. Like I think that's fine. But if you just have, you know, twenty or thirty, that that's too much. And so I I I guess a tip I would say maybe not a homestead hack, 
but a tip is to just feed what you can find and do the best with what you have. Uh, like we do have organic feed around us, but it's not close by. Uh, and the, the there is organic feed at our feed stores, but it's super expensive. It's it like three yeah. times the amount of regular feed. And I know that, but there are stores out there where you can find non-GMO and organic feed and it's not nearly that expensive just because it's like local and closer and stuff. So my, my, my first tip would be, at least for your animals, to do the best with what you've got and don't stress about trying to like get the perfect feed. Yep. Unless that's something that's super, super important to you. But I spent too much time yeah. and too much money and I, I just stressed about it a little what bit. What was it? What, we were buying some sort of, it was some sort of hay that you wanted the goats to have. That was the chaff hay. It was chaff hay. Now that was something, I did want to get some chaff hay to begin with because that's what they were used to. And mm, I, yeah. that, that was important. At least I felt like when we first got them here to have the chaff hay. So they, you know, it was something that they were used to eating. We weren't going to change their diet too much because we got them from Kansas. Uh, and so that was important, but we stuck with the chaff hay for quite a while. Even though we had to drive almost three hours to, yeah, we, to find it. We had to drive a long way. And I did like the chaff hay. Yeah. Um, it, it's a, more of a grain supplement for when you're... So instead of using grain, you use this fermented hay. They put alfalfa hay in a bag, and they put some molasses in there and let it ferment. So when you open it up, it smells great. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it might not, but it really it sounds does. Sounds like it's a molasses cookie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it smells really sweet, and the goats loved it. Like, they devoured it. It was awesome. So if you have chaff hay near you, you can use it. Uh, it's a good uh, to use it instead of grain at feeding. We would feed chaff hay and some oats. Uh, but anyway... It was just too far away. It was too much stress, so. too much driving. Yeah, kind of like haylage. Yep. It's real specific. <laughs> it was, uh, I think they make it in Texas, I believe, is where chaff hay is made. Go see what yeah, I'll go see. But chaff hay is like a brand. Like, it comes in right. its own little bag and stuff. But anyway, it's ex it's it's not too expensive. No, but, but the problem was... Yeah, I'll be right back. He had done like all this is what we're talking about. He had done all this research to find like the perfect thing that he wanted to feed the goats, but it wasn't practical for where we lived. And so the first year or two, we wasted a lot of time driving around trying to get this here and that there, and gas is expensive, and it just, it, that doesn't make sense. You know, the best thing to do is to feed what you can find locally um, and not not be so worried about differences in brands unless you live somewhere where you have the ability to have a lot of options close by and don't do a lot of driving around. So. Uh, let's see, we missed a couple. Allison, thanks for joining us. And yes, thank you, Gathered Together. If you hit that like button, it helps us out in the algorithm. So give us a thumbs up if you're enjoying this. Um, okay, so let's talk about... Excuse me. Uh, let's talk about the garden. I need to talk about that first. Some hacks that I've learned for the garden. The biggest hack I've learned is thou shalt not put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. So to have multiple gardening types which really helps protect your garden no matter what the weather or mother nature or animals throw at it, you'll not lose everything. Um, so we have we have uh, two greenhouses, but only one of them is growing something right now because the other one has sheep in it. Um, we have two greenhouses. We have some uh, tires that we use as raised beds. I have a spring in the ground, which is like a closely planted garden with lettuce mixes and potatoes. And then I have a traditional row garden, which is not currently planted, but will be planted soon. And having all those different options means, you know, if we were going to have some just drenching rains that was going to maybe flood some areas, at least they know what's in the greenhouse would be okay and what's in the raised beds would be okay. You know, if, um, if it gets super hot sometime and maybe too hot for the greenhouse, I know what's in the ground is going to be okay. So spreading it out is a good idea. It also is better time-wise because when you have it spread out, the planting times are different instead of just having one big row garden where all of a sudden all your plantings are like all together and then you have to spend 40 hours in one week putting some, everything in the ground. Sometimes it helps divert disaster if you have... Like, there have been some times where we had rabbits really bad, or, like, if the goats get out and get into something, they're not going to ruin the entire garden. They might ruin some up. of it, yeah. but it's split up, and at least if you have an animal getting in something, it's it hopefully won't ruin everything. Hello, Aunt Holly. Welcome. Thanks for jumping in. 
And then also for the garden, I've discovered I've discovered through lots of trial and error, the my opinion, the best way to do a traditional row garden is to make sure that your your rows you're so loud, your rows are spaced far enough in between that you could drive a wheelbarrow through it. That's the distance that'll say. The reason that I really like that is because you have enough space in between rows that it's very easy to either run your hoe like or run. Three feet apart? Yeah. If you have a space for it, you can run your hoe, you can run your big wheel, you can get in there with a wheelbarrow or a very large bucket or crate to fill things up. Hey. And it also gives you a lot of space to be able to turn around when you're weeding to really, without worrying about sitting on the plants behind you. And also when the kids help, it's very clear for them to see where the lanes are so that they aren't um, getting in and accidentally stepping all over or sitting on your plants. So I have the rows spaced farther apart. And then I also do straw right up against the plants that I've planted. So what it looks like, it's like a row of say green beans growing up and then straw packed in around the sprouted green beans and then dirt lanes in between, which I can hoe. And for me, I feel like that's the best way to be able to keep the weeds at a minimum, to let the kids help, be able to get in there easily and out of there easily, and to try to keep um, the plants, the straw helps and keep the moisture in. I used to think that the goal of row gardening was to cram as much in there mm. as possible. Yeah. And then it was really hard to get in there and weed. It was impossible for the kids to be in there to help and it made gardening really stressful. So that's my two cents on that. Um, Jennifer? Jennifer, welcome. <laughs> Rhymes with, so Jennifer, anger, right? <laughs> Rhymes with danger. Rhymes with danger? <laughs> I like that. So Thanks welcome. for jumping in. Yeah. Your first live with us. <clears throat> okay, I'll do my last garden one, and then you can talk more about animals. Ow, dude. And my last garden one is when you're Easy. harvesting it and you have like 6,000 of something, um, and it's time to can, what I do is anything that could possibly be frozen and canned later, I'll do that. And so like tomatoes, I will just freeze them in Walmart grocery, like plastic grocery sacks all summer long. And then in the fall, when the garden is completely done, I'll take all the tomatoes out of the freezer and then I'll process them. And the really nice thing about that is that frozen tomatoes, their skins fall right off. You don't have to boil them to skin them. And it makes making sauce um, or whatever you're making 10,000 times easier because you get to skip the step of having to boil and then try to peel a super hot tomato, um, which I like. And that way, in the summer, when it's really busy and there's a lot to do, I can focus on canning things that have to be canned immediately, like green beans, and save things like tomatoes uh, for later. So, And Melissa, yes, I freeze them whole. Um, I, I wash them, and if they have a, like a bud on them, um, I'll scrape that out. I don't core them, though. I just freeze them whole. And then what I'll do is usually then if I know I'm going to can the next day before I go to bed that night, I'll just take them all out of the freezer and put them in the fridge. And by the morning, they're somewhat defrosted enough that the skins peel off. And then I go ahead and start making whatever I'm going to make. What, what else you got for animals? Oh, see, I've got some tips for chickens. Uh, one of the things that I really like, especially since we have ducks too, is uh, a nipple waterer. They, uh, you can fill up a really big jug. They don't make a big mess. A lot of times, especially with the ducks too, uh, if you get a water that's got like a trough in it, it can get really messy and dirty. Uh, but if you get a nipple waterer, a lot of people even have it, a nipple waterer fed by like 50 or 100 gallons. But uh, it really cuts down on your, your watering. It keeps their, their water really nice and tidy and clean and not messy. Uh, another tip that I have that we've started, we didn't do at the beginning, but I've started doing this with all of the new chicks that we get. Whenever it comes time to start laying, whatever kind of a nest box you have, that's uh, to put a few fake eggs in there. Now, if you don't put any fake eggs in there, they will probably go in the nest box anyway. But we had a really bad problem for a little while with chickens that ate their own eggs. Like they pop them out and then just immediately start, start eating them. Uh, and so if you start with fake eggs in that nest box, they're ceramic. So the chickens can peck them if they want. Like they're gonna be a little curious. Uh, but they might, they might peck them, but they're not going to get anywhere if it's a ceramic egg. 
So like maybe a month or at least a few weeks before they're supposed to start laying, get a couple of those ceramic eggs. We can find them at our farm store. You could probably find them online too. But pop a couple of those ceramic eggs in there. That way, before they even start laying, they can kind of play with them and they'll figure out that they're, they're uh, kind of worthless to them. And they'll get the idea like, oh, this is kind of a cool place for eggs. Uh, it's, it's helped us a lot to use that uh, here. I'd say probably the last two years is when I started using them a little bit more religiously with our new chicks that we've got. Uh, it shows them where to lay them and you don't have to deal with any of that. Ugh, it was such a mess. You'd have to try and beat the chickens out there every morning uh, to try and get eggs and then have to check two or three times a day. And sometimes that's not even, uh, it, it's not even worth it because they're going to lay it and immediately peck it. So if you don't time it right. Uh, but anyway, those are kind of some chicken tips. I also have enjoyed, and some people might not like this, but um, we let chickens free range for a while. Uh, and we've, we've kind of bounced back and forth between letting them free range, just go wherever they want, and then also putting them in a fence. And you can keep chickens inside a fence if you clip their wings. It's super, super easy. You just have to, I usually do it about once a year. You just take one side of their wings and you clip, uh, you can look up videos that are a little more technical, but you just clip the edge of their wings off and they can't fly. So if you do need to contain them, you can. There for a while, we didn't clip wings, we didn't have a fence, and chickens were everywhere, laying eggs everywhere, pooping everywhere. If you don't have a good system in place, free range, and we had a bunch of chickens. It's not like we just had three. We had like 40 or maybe even more. Yeah, I'd say about 40 at that time. We had free-range chickens everywhere, and you couldn't walk out of either door without stepping on chicken poop, like just covered back and front door, and uh, and they just made a mess uh, everywhere. So it was nice to be able to clip their wings and keep them inside a fence. It worked well. It doesn't hurt them, uh, and so far... It's like a haircut. Kind of, and it, it, for us anyway, it hasn't resulted in like more losses to predators or anything. Like They can still... Uh, squirt away if they need to but those are some of my little chicken tips that have helped us <clears throat> okay um so i had some like kitchen ish hacks so i spent a lot of time in the kitchen Ten tends to be on a homestead i feel like you kind of have one person that just a lot, does a lot of outside stuff and one person does a lot of inside stuff because there's just a lot to do everywhere especially when there's kids mm -hmm. um but some of my favorite kitchen hacks, so start like with cast iron. So I cook almost exclusively on cast iron. The only thing I don't cook in cast iron are like soups, which um, I have like stainless steel pots for that. Um, it's, or tomato products, because really acidic products kind of get funny in cast iron. Um, but a lot of people are intimidated by cast iron um, because it's so different, right? Like other pots we're just used to, you cook on it and you wash it, right? And you want it squeaky clean and then you can use it again. But cast iron, you want to keep it nice and greasy so that it doesn't rust. So people get really nervous about how it's to not, wash it. It's not really like greasy. You just need that. Yeah, I don't want to call it a there. patina. Yeah, seasoning. It's not like yeah, patina. You need that seasoning. But on you there, don't. But... You don't want to wash it with like Dawn dish soap because um, that'll actually ruin your pan. And so um, people get nervous about how to wash it. Um, and so basically, so I have a, if you Google Teal or YouTube TLS Farm cast iron, I have a short, it's like 50 seconds long about how to clean cast iron. But one of my favorite things for cast iron cleaning is the chain mail scrubber, excuse me, which is great because it's entirely reusable like 10 million times. So you don't have to keep rebuying something. And it scrapes off every last little burn done whatever. I mean, I made... The girls helped me cook breakfast the other day, and they were wonderful, and they worked so hard. But they made scrambled eggs, and they <laughs> they were very, very well done and just, like, adhered to the bottom of my formerly nicely seasoned cast iron pan. But this got it right off. And all you need, you just run super hot water into your cast iron pan, and then you just scrub it until there's no residue on it. Um, and this is just it gets every nook and cranny and then you put your pan on your stove top again and just over low heat until all the water has evaporated and then you go ahead i use baking grease to to season my pans i just rub it on there and you don't after. have to do that every single no time. but anytime <clears throat> you give it a really good wash with hot water and scrub down it needs to be dried if you just 
sit it in your dish drain wet, it's going to start rusting on you. Oh, so, sweet. Thank you, Debbie and Tara. I'm still hesitant with cast iron. Yep. Yeah, I, I felt that way for a long time, too. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I don't mm -hmm. cook on it nearly as much as, as Laura does, but it is... I, sometimes I say to Laura, I'm like, ah, uh, like it's almost easier than some of the other stuff because, uh, like Allison is saying, you know, stuff doesn't really stick to it. it. Most of the time you just wipe it out when you're done pretty much mm -hmm. and you're ready to go. I think sometimes you got to be careful. Like if you're cooking something like fish and stuff in yeah, there, it can, can kind of grab smells, smell a little bit, but, mm -hmm. uh, as long as you have like a, a dedicated pan for some of that, that kind of stuff. Cast iron is awesome. It makes stuff taste so good. It does. It and it's you don't have to worry about, like, Teflon <clears throat> flakes getting into your food or anything like that. And, and like Allison said, once you've been using it a long time, if you've been taking care of it, so if you've been not washing it with dish soap and you've been um, keeping it seasoned, which means that you're adding your grease or your oil or whatever it is um, to make sure it's got that nice, I don't want to call it greasy look, but it is kind of a greasy look. Like when you look at a cast iron pan, it shouldn't look dull. In my opinion, this is my cast iron. But I mean, you obviously don't want it to be like dripping grease. So some, meet, meet me in the middle there. But if you do that, um, you'll have a really nice pan that's basically always nonstick. Yeah, unless just you really to... burn something yeah. like the girls did. So, right. um, Debbie says, I've heard if you do need to use soap, you have to make sure it's dry. Like, you might mean bone dry, then season it with oil. If seasoned well, you'll have no problem. Yeah, you have to make sure you dry it. If you, anytime you have to wash it, especially if you ever use soap, make sure you dry it all the way. Otherwise that soap residue can suck into the pan and then everything tastes like mm -hmm. soap. Yeah, uh, Tara, the cast iron will last you lifetimes. Yep. Like a lot of people pass it down to their kids and stuff because it, it, it pretty much doesn't change. You can't, you almost can't hurt it really. And I know a lot of people uh, like their their big drawback to that is that you can't put it in a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, if if mo for most of the time all it takes is a wipeout, like that's right. that's for us anyway. It's not that so big of a deal. Allison says I just rub with baking grease and a paper towel. Is there a better way? I mean, that's a great way to do it. Um, we don't. Sometimes we have paper towels and sometimes sometimes we don't. I don't buy them regularly, but I buy them when we have guests like Grammy, who likes her paper towels. Or um, we have a party coming or having up a party. or something um, like that. So when I don't have paper towels, I do typically use bacon grease, though, because it's free, because we eat bacon. And um, I'll just use, I'll make sure the pan's warm, and I'll just use a spoon, just like, and use the, I'll put a little bit of bacon grease in the middle of the pan, it'll melt, and then I just use the back side of a spoon and just swirl it around in there, make sure it gets all the way over the pan, and that does fine. I know Heidi from Rain Country Homestead, she cuts tiny little squares of old t-shirts, keeps them in a stack, and that's her um, cast iron greasers. And she'll use the same one like four to five times before she throws it in a burn barrel because it's got all that grease on it and makes a great lighting spark hmm, for when she burns her trash. So. Let's see, Debbie says, don't spray cooking spray on the cast iron because it makes a film. I can see that. And Lois. Ooh, to an one. SOS pad. So, yeah, I mean, they really do, and you can, yeah, if you, you can, have one you that, heal that you feel like is just destroyed, you can use a, I don't know what kind of sander it is, but that they use on, like, cars, it's like heavy-duty oh, okay. rotating sander, and sand uh -huh. the first little layer of metal, iron, cast iron off, and then re-season it. Um, I've seen people do that before. Cast iron, it's an, it is an expensive pan, comparatively. You know, versus going to Walmart and buying the cheap nonstick pan. I mean, it's going to be... I think if you were to buy, like, a but, nice, like, professional set, like, mm -hmm. I don't think it's that expensive. Um, I have nonstick cast iron that I got from QVC. Don't use anything that creates lint. I've gotten lint in cast iron. I have never had that happen, but that's mm -hmm. a good tip. I could I could see that happening. That is a good idea. It says, I've always washed my cast iron, but I season after each use. I have several of my grandmother's cast iron pans. Yeah, yes. they, they last forever. Mm -hmm. They really do. So, um, okay. Other kitchen. So, I also, on really busy homestead days or days when we have to go to town, trying to resist that need to eat out a lot because that gets really expensive and also it's not very good for you. Um, I've gotten um, really into cooking one, what I call cooking one time a day. Um, I think we have a video on it, and I think it's like 
cook three meals in 30 minutes, I think is what I titled it. But the idea is that if I get up first, I can put, um, I could put like dinner in a crock pot. I could um, pre-make lunches and have them in the fridge and then cook breakfast. And then I am all done cooking for the day. And that way you only have to clean up your kitchen one time, um, other than dishes, but the little girls, even the little girls can wash plates. It's the big pans that are tricky. Um, and you also are not spending your whole day in the kitchen cooking lunch and then cooking dinner and having mm -hmm. it interrupt your I day. I know you feel like it takes a lot of stress out of your it life because everything's just ready to go and it's it's not like oh I gotta make time to mm -hmm. be an hour you know for lunch or dinner trying to get something going. Well and then you have to like clean all the pots every time and it's just obnoxious. Sometimes it feels like but like today Annie had therapy and so when I uh, breakfast was already food that was already in the freezer so I pulled out some frozen muffins and bananas so there was no cooking and then lunch we had sandwiches and while I was making the sandwiches I took out a big like 9 by 13 pan and I put shredded pre-cooked pork on one section and then I had a section of diced potatoes and a section of baby carrots and a section of frozen green beans do some seasoning on everything put aluminum foil on the top and then um, I Sam was home by five and he slid it in the oven and by the time I got home at six all that food had cooked and then we had a full tray of food ready to serve and the only thing there was to clean up after dinner was the 9 by 13 pan. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Tara asks mm -hmm. if there is a brand of cast iron you recommend. I mean the like the name brand is Lodge. Mm -hmm. I will say but, Lodge uh, is like kind of like the gold standard and you can tell they are very heavy pan like it's a nice cast iron. I have some Amazon Basics cast iron pans and they've been really good for me. I've not had any problems with them. They are lighter, so I would say that maybe they won't last generations and generations, but they've been really good pans and they are, um, they're considerably, I would say they're 30% less expensive. You might, uh, Tara, if you, if you're looking for, uh, if you keep your eye open, they have deals on them like at Orschlin's. I know they've sold uh, Lodge there before, and sometimes they have deals, because I don't imagine a lot of people go to Orschlin's looking for cast iron, and so they just need to get them off the shelf. So if you if you keep an eye and mm -hmm. check in every once in a while, they'll have them on sale. And actually, sometimes Amazon has Lodge uh, cast iron on sale, yep. the, uh, especially like around holidays when they do their big sales and stuff. They'll have them at a great price, and you can get a small pan to, to try or whatever. And I also really enjoy, if you've been around here, you know I love to pressure can. And so one of my favorite things to do is when I make a soup or a stew, um, I'll make like a double or a triple batch and we'll eat some for dinner. Mm -hmm. And then the rest I can up in quart jars. So then for a lunch, you know, this is lunch, pause time, lunch is on the shelf. It takes five minutes to warm it back up. I don't oh, have to recoup. I'm telling you too, the stew that sits in the can or for you know like six months eight months i swear it's better than the fresh stuff it too. is i don't know why but it is okay little people, people do you want to say hi annie I'm saying? My it's, i don't know <laughs> the girls are walking around the kitchen right now let's see um, uh let's see my ex and i used cast iron back in the day then used stainless steel pans mm -hmm. i don't know much about the cast iron back in the day no youtube nobody told me <laughs> <laughs> i know I think about that every time I go to work on a car or vehicle or do something around the farm. I'm like, I would be stuck without YouTube because I always... You always look take, everything Yeah, up. I always take five minutes to watch a video and some guy will be like, well, here's a trick to help you. It'll, it'll make it so much easier and faster or whatever. Well, Let's see. So, so uh, Debbie, thank you. We think, uh, we think that baby's pretty cute too. So... Um, Buckeyes. Buckeyes. That was it. Used to carry cast iron. Is a Buckeyes? Is that a farm truck? Never heard of that. I'm before. not sure. I know I've heard of Buckeyes, but I don't. I think. Uh, yeah, even even like Walmart and Target have Lodge cast iron um, in stock. You won't have a lot of choices about what kind, what size pan you want. But if you just wanted to get started, and really any any like all purpose type or a farm store will have. I, I think that like if you really wanted. Like, you can look for people that hand make it and stuff mm -hmm. if you wanted to get something that's, you know, really nice and fancy, but it's probably twice as much as Lodge, too, if, you, if it was something you really enjoyed. Yep. 
Um, what about you got? What do you got? I don't know. I don't have very many left. Um, let's see. Okay, I have I have a tip for electric fence because I, I feel like I'm a pro now with our goats because they have tested it every which way. But, but I don't know why this is something that I never really realized. Uh, mostly because I guess the way I've done electric fence in the past and at other farms we never did this. But look, uh, if you're having issues with your animals getting out and like you know your fence is hot but it doesn't seem to be working quite as well, check your ground rods um, because I needed like four times as many ground rods as I thought I did. Initially I was just putting, we weren't even, uh, we didn't even have that much electric fence out, but I was just putting one ground rod in like maybe a foot or so. And so finally I went and bought like four six foot ground rods, put them five foot uh, into the ground and spaced them out a few feet from each other. Uh, and those goats do not get out anymore. Those ground rods, uh, those ground rods make that fence hit really, really <laughs> nice hard. Little ping. It's a I've been zapped by it a, a handful of times, and it's no picnic. So that's that's one of my tips. If your fence isn't working, I mean, obviously do the other fence things. Make sure it's not touching the ground or touching a post, or you got a limb down on it or whatever. But if all else fails, look at those ground rods. Uh, it should be the first thing. Like when you're putting it in, you'd think that you you. You, you do that but I didn't but I, I looked at I like literally looked up the uh went to a website to the manufacturer to see what they recommended mm -hmm. and followed it I feel like you should actually make a, followed the instructions make a video and, like why is my electric fence not working and go through all the things that we've learned because when we started we were just like what you just like put it up and plug it in and it's hot right and it does not work like that so okay we'll take we'll care, take care of it. he's okay uh let's see I had a whole bunch come through Iris Lady says, your RTLs are a good place to find cast iron. Don't worry, frost it, we'll clean up. Yes, mm, that is very that is true. true. Um, Debbie, 58, so no internet? Yeah, figured it out. Doesn't work. Try again or holler for help. Yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Allison says, that's how I feel about my chickens. I have 11 and they learned it all from YouTube. They are 10 weeks, my first chickens. What chicken food do you use? Uh, right now, we just use whatever we can find at Orsland's. Um, a lot of times it's whatever is on sale. I don't, uh, right now I'm feeding our ducks and our chickens, uh, and we'll probably do the same thing. We're getting some more geese, we're going to, going to get geese and mm -hmm. some more ducks. Uh, I just feed them like an all flock feed right now. Uh, I'm trying to remember what brand it is. It's, it's like on the tip of my tongue. I can't I can't think. I can see the bag. the bag. But anyway, it's a little higher in protein than what chicken food is. Uh, but I'm not all that picky. Because right? there for a while, like in the past, we fed our chickens like almost entirely on scrap food. Like mm -hmm. when our chickens were free range and you knew. Now in the winter, it's different. I would get feed for them then because they can't scrounge as much. But in the summer, when our chickens were free range, uh, You'd throw scraps out for them so they were getting a little bit of food uh, that way, but they pretty much lived on bugs and whatever other stuff they could find, and they did quite well. They did. Uh, but anyway, I'm not too picky anymore. Um, Let's see. Do we have a link to the game? Hello uh, from Vermont. Hi, Pete. Thanks for joining us. I'm, every time Pete... We always enjoy having you. Every time you come in and you, you, know, you say you're from Vermont, I always get my Connecticut bias. <laughs> Because Vermont is where all the hillbillies lived growing up in Connecticut. And I know our friend Bill is from Vermont, and he always calls me a flatlander from down in flat Connecticut. <laughs> but uh, Lois says, sometimes you can even find good cast iron at garage sales. Yep, or flea markets, or I don't know that you would want to find a used one on eBay. It's going to cost you like $10 million in shipping because they're so heavy. But, yeah, that could be. Um, here we go. Ripping Jack says, My dad drove a 20 foot ground rod into the ground to assure ground for this one building. It still failed to work 100%. Whenever the electrical inspectors came around, they would pour saline water. Huh. That's crazy. 20 foot ground rod. That's nuts. <clears throat> Take me to Tammy's house. Hello, hello. And country girl Welcome. from Ontario. Um, okay, I have a couple more. So okay. another kitchen hack that really saves me a lot of time. 
Um, I pre-make a whole bunch of mixes. So this one's my muffin mix, which is almost empty. But on the other side of this camera, I also have a pancake and a waffle and a brownie mix. And I just, these are gallon sized jars and I make them all and just keep them loaded. And then when, especially for um, breakfast or for the brownie one, I have a couple recipes I can use from dessert. It's already like 90% of the work is already done. You add like an egg and some water and then you mix it up. Excuse me, and it lets me put food on the table a lot faster, um, which is nice. And it saves a lot of money over buying box mixes at the store over and over again, especially with a lot of kids where we need to do double and triple batches of everything. So I um, highly recommend doing something like that. And um, I think I have videos on how I make all of those, but I'm not, um, I don't have a link right now. So uh, Pete says to, keep, to help keep the charge up on our fence, we sometimes have to pour five gallon buckets of water on mm -hmm. the ground rod. Yep, I've had to do that too. Uh, let's see, Iris Lady. Ground rods work better in damp soil. Yep, during drought, don't water the rod using a metal watering can. You can get, get quite a shock. shock. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought about that either. <clears throat> Layman's in Kidron, Ohio, mm -hmm. and the Lodge Store in Seaverville, Tennessee. I bet That'd they be have cool some, to yeah. I bet they have cool they have stuff. Cool stuff there at the store. That'd be a neat place to visit. Let's see. Allison asked, do you grind up your eggshells and feed them back to chickens? We, we have done that in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it gives them calcium, which helps harden their eggshells when they lay eggs, which can be a good mm -hmm. thing. But I would be really careful doing that. Uh, either grind them up really well or, like, you know, mash them up really well. Mm -hmm. uh, because you could, like I was talking earlier, you could make your chickens want eggs. And then they're going to lay them and then peck them. Right. And so uh, what you can do if you feel like you are you need stronger uh, eggshells, like from your chickens as they're laying them, they sell uh, oyster shell mm -hmm. at feed stores. You can get it. You can buy one bag and it will last you like forever. Uh, but I'm sure they smell, sell smaller bags too. But uh, that's what I've usually used in lieu of eggshells is uh, the oyster shell crushed right. up. But. And for our eggshells, I put them in my compost pile right now. And it, that's another thing I had on here. If you aren't composting, like YouTube makes composting sound so complicated, some of these videos. And the only thing that the complicated composting does is it gets you from junk or wasted stuff to dirt faster. Your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents just had a pile and it just broke down and that's what will happen so um, don't feel intimidated about starting a compost pile if you don't want to get all sciencey about it if you have a spot where you're putting some yard waste and some organic matter it eventually will break back down into dirt and um, it keeps it out of the trash bin and it's a good way to kind of sustainably get rid of whatever excess you have um, and a lot of that excess you could also feed to the chicken too. Mm -hmm. Chickens as scrap too. Yep. But let's see. Blessed Mama, I uh, just made your muffin mix mm -hmm. last night. It's so handy. There we go. Hopefully everybody catches up there. Sorry about that. Uh, Allison, do you just do that once they start laying? Yeah. You you, you don't you shouldn't really need to give them uh, the oyster shell mm -hmm. or the cal the extra calcium before they start laying. So once you see them start doing it, you can put that out there. And I, depending on how many chickens you have, it just needs like a little bowl or a little pan and they'll eat it as they need it. Like they can, they can uh, kind of self-serve on that. Uh, hello from <clears throat> Arkansas. Welcome. Hello, and Pete said we like the oyster shell. We also add brewer's yeast as a supplement for the ducks since we feed them the same. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's good a good idea. idea. We have a lot of breweries in a town not too mm -hmm. far from us. We, we could probably get all the brewer's yeast. We ever wanted. We wanted. Uh, do you find that composting draws rats or mice? We no. have so many cats. <laughs> <laughs> We've got like five or six cats, and they keep a lot of those those little rodents uh, away. There's it feels like there's always a dead mouse mm -hmm. somewhere outside that the cats have left for us to to find. Um, how do you plan out your meals for the week months so you don't get bored with the same meals? So that's a great question, actually. I plan my meals usually about a week in advance, and I actually have a chart that magnets to the fridge, and I write down breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, the magnet's actually broken on it now, so it sits on top of my fridge. But um, I just, I don't know, like, and I, I uh, so I do one week at a time, 
and then I kind of... We, we do have some days where yeah. it's like, we're always going to eat like this or that on those days because it's a quick, easy meal. Mm -hmm. And and so some of that's like, you know, if you're trying to plan for a month, it might feel overwhelming. Yeah, I don't but... like planning for a whole month because I, I do feel like it feels overwhelming, especially because <clears> it really <throat> bothers me when like our schedule changes and then I had this meal planned, but that's not possible this day and you have to like exit out or whatever. I'm like, oh, so I plan for a week at a time, and when I, I usually plan on Sundays, and so when I sit down to plan, I just kind of peek in my freezer or on my pantry, or I have like a phone app where I keep like a list of everything that I have, and just kind of plan meals around what I have and then pick up extra things at the store. That That's one of the benefits of having like half a hog or mm -hmm. a whole hog and a quarter beef in your freezer and having a pantry that's well stocked is you almost kind of have your grocery store right, right here. here. So, yeah. you know, there are things we, we have to get uh, every, every so often, but mm -hmm. like when it comes to meals, you know, we do have enough food for a month and uh, so she can just plan one week at a time. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest key is the better stocked your pantry is and the, it just, then you have a lot of options and it doesn't feel so overwhelming. I don't spend a lot of time like looking up new recipes and things like yeah every once in a while like one of us will see something we'll be like let's, let's try, try that. that and and uh and then ever the whole family will decide if it's a keeper or not <laughs> yeah if we let me tell you what it is never uh like eight for eight somebody always That's has true. to not like something so That's you're never true. gonna make everybody happy um <clears throat> I think a lot of times you get stuck in the cycle, at least I know from the past for me, a, a cycle of cooking the same thing all the time because you just, like, you it's don't easy. have, it's easy yeah. and, you, and you're in a hurry. And so you just, like, and your pantry's not well enough stocked, so you're like, what can I make fast? And you're like, uh, chicken cooks super fast. And then you end up eating chicken all the time, chicken and, you know, frozen vegetables or whatever. But when your pantry's well stocked, especially your, like, canning pantry with all these ready-to-go meals, like, then you just, like, you're like, oh, man, I'm way behind today. We had can chicken on up? Tuesday the last three weeks. But, yeah. oh, no, we've got some of that beef yeah, stew. Yeah, we've got some of that beef stew. So. Whatever. Um, Pop it so, up. Laura, you do a great job at such a young age raising family, <clears throat> cooking and baking and such. Sam is a wonderful husband and a great help. He Aww, is. And thank, thank you, you, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. You, I know you don't get to see him a lot on camera because he's very busy, but he does a whole lot around here that you guys don't get to see and, and appreciate with me. So, um Consider planning meals based on what is in season. Yeah, yes, very that's true. very true. Yep. I like to also buy, so I don't grow everything I can. I know like there are some huge homesteads that I do, and that's amazing. But um, I buy a lot of stuff that's in season because the price is cheaper, and then I can it. So, you know, I've got 20 quarts of potatoes in my pantry. Did I grow 20 quarts of potatoes? No. Um, but I bought them um, in the fall when potatoes were really cheap for Thanksgiving, and I canned them. And now I have cheap potatoes available to me all year round, even when the potatoes are in the season. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, I want to show you my my favorite homestead inside item, and it's probably not what you think it will be. So, no, it's kind of random, but I was thinking about this. So, this is a flower sack tile, and I think flower sack tiles are something um, that I, I didn't know about before we started homesteading, but you can use them for, like, absolutely everything. From um, straining cheese and straining, um, straining like whey when you're making yogurt if you want it thicker. Um, you can use them as your cleaning rags. Um, I, you can use them to cover things like if you're fermenting and you don't need a tightly covered lid, you need it gently covered, you put this on top. And I also use them for diapers, not the same ones I use in the kitchen. I have a stack for diapers and a stack for in the kitchen. but. Um, Flower sack towels can diaper a baby from birth until they're potty trained, just depending on how you fold them. And if you consider that a flower sack towel is about a dollar yeah, each. super, super cheap. Um, you know, you buy 25 of them and you spend $25 and then you don't have to buy diapers. Like, that's an incredible amount of savings. Um, and it just, it, you just have to, I have two different folds that I do. Um, Especially, like, to fold how much them. are... are uh disposable diapers like a dollar each no disposable mm -hmm. diapers it depends the brand you buy but the cheapest ones are 10 cents each so every time you oh, throw okay. away disposable diaper just hear that coins but cents. like pampers is like 30 something cents okay. each if you're buying the name so it wouldn't brand. take you too long to... it wouldn't take you very long at all to pay for themselves so um that's one thing that i don't know i just 
it sounds weird, passionate about my flower sack towels, but you know, you buy they a stack for your kitchen with, and a stack for your yeah. babies and you save yourself so much money because you're not sure. buying all this, you know, not buying coffee filters to cover my fermenting stuff, I'm not buying paper towels to clean my counter, I'm not buying um, cheese cloth, which doesn't really last very long in order to strain my cheeses and my yogurt, it's like really good. flower all, sack all towel. Purpose. All purpose, okay. just to have some on so. hand. Uh, Debbie, I realize Sam is super busy. I wish him well going to school. Well, thank you. It's going pretty good so far. Uh, Holly says, I have always used flower sack towels. Mm -hmm. Take me to Tammy's house. My oldest son wore cloth diapers. Yep. And Pete says, we have many cloth diapers from our twins. Still in use as rags. Yep. Uh, every once in a while when a diaper gets just too, you know, starts fraying at the edges and stuff. And I'll uh, turn it into a cleaning rag until it's met the end of its life so you're saving a lot of stuff from the trash can and saving yourself a lot of money so uh what else what do you got you've got uh, i don't really have much else with the with the animals uh you have your oh so yeah i also make make my own laundry soap this is not actually apple juice i just reused the bottle but um we make our own laundry soap here, which saves us tons of money, tons of money, and it cleans really well. And so that's something else it's you can super, do. How much? It how used much, to be twenty dollars per year was like my tagline. We have a video, and that was what we used. But I was only doing laundry for like four or five people at that point. That's now true. there's eight, so it's probably more like sixty dollars a year. But still, if you consider that you know, a box of Tide is like twenty something dollars, that only lasts you. A month or whatever mm -hmm. like it pays for itself really quickly the downside though with this homemade soap that i use all the time is if you have an he machine this is not going to do a good job for you because they don't use enough water to really get stuff clean but i even use this on my cloth diapers which always gets very passionate people in the comment section but <laughs> i will tell you in oh nine years of cloth diapering the only soap that has given me problems is the cloth diaper, expensive cloth diaper soap that everyone swears by. It caused rashes, it, and my diaper smelled like ammonia, I didn't get them clean, but this got clean diapers and happy buns. Well, so. th this and hanging them outside is key, out in <laughs> yeah, the sun. Yeah, hanging them out in the sun. Uh, Alice says, you have taught me a lot about no waste. Laundry soap is great, mostly use rags. What is the brand of scrubbers you have, Andy? Do you want to grab one of our dish scrubbers? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I can't think, the brand name is not famous. I found them on Amazon purely by mistake. And I was like, I wonder if these dish scrappers will be any good. And they have been amazing. <laughs> Had them for over a year and I'm still only using like six in the rotation and the packet came with 12. If you look at our video called um, seven no waste trade-offs to your kitchen, the link to these is in there. The tag is yeah. worn off. I, I think the brand was at home. Home. Yeah, it looks something like that. that. Like something that. home. But it's uh, it's about the size of a sponge. One side is kind of a soft cloth, cloth, and the other side is a micro fiber, almost velcro-y feels for scrubbing. Yeah, what is that? It's like a. What is that? Yeah. Anyway, it um, scrubs. It scrubs really. I, well. I was, I didn't think it was gonna scrub that great, but this side does a great job scrubbing. Really, really good. Uh, Sam is a snob of dishwashing. If you've never met Sam, no, he is it, very part. And so when I told him that we were going to get rid of the Dobie sponges, which is what we had been using forever, right. because that's the only thing that he liked. And if he's going to do dishes, we're going to make sure that he's happy, right? I said, I'm going to use these instead. And he was like, oh, that reusable stuff. It's not going to do as good a job. But he... No, they, I, I love those things. Scrubs they just do as well. a great job. And you don't get that, you know that weird smell that sponges get after yeah. a while? Mm -hmm. These don't ever smell like that. Mm -hmm. And when they get a little bit too dirty, then they just go in our rag bucket and they get cleaned with all of our other cleaning rags. They don't clean them special. So. Oh, those are great. So. We did two, use. Two thumbs up. We have tried to make our own dish soap before and it actually worked pretty well except on plastic stuff. Yeah. It left like a film, and so it actually, you know, like got greasy things clean and stuff. But for some reason, on plastic, I left the film. And since we use plastic plates because our kids break everything, we just buy dish soap now because it didn't work well on plastic, which is weird because usually it's the other way. It's like your metal mm -hmm. stuff that things don't scrub. So Tara says, I spend a lot on diapers, but cloth might, might kill me. Yeah, you know, it, it it is a lot of work. 
it's a it's, life it's kind of just part of life now yeah. for us like it's, i'm used to it but it is yeah. extra work because you have to clean work. them and they really do need to be hung out um <clears throat> and things like that so you do have to deal with the poo it's not i don't feel like it's gross at this point it's so used to it's just part it's just part of the cycle mm -hmm. it's just what we do yeah laura's phone's dying we're about ready to run we're, out of battery <laughs> we probably need to wrap it up so uh, let's see what else we have oh i was hung the cloth diapers on the clothesline made them so it white it does bleaches them like they're brand new uh, and allison says thanks i am too sam need a dish soap that is better but i really love dawn we, we use a lot of dawn too. yeah that's i only buy the blue dawn because not only is blue dawn great for washing dishes it gets every stain out of anything like if you get a grease stain on your clothes blue dawn if you get a crayon stain on your clothes blue dawn if somebody gets grass stains on their clothes blue dawn <laughs> So. See, my husband, we were fairly poor, so mm -hmm. we had to use cloth diapers. Yep. I think what, like, one thing that kind of frustrates me now, there's so many options out there for cloth diapers, and some of them are really expensive, and people feel like they can't use cloth diapers to save money because they feel like, oh, it's going to $400 yeah, to get my set. Front. But that's just, like, the prim, primo, top-of-the-line stuff. Like, cloth diapering is so simple, but we don't talk a lot about the simple cloth diapering. We just show the fancy cute little owls, you know, owls and spaceships and patterned on one diapers. So Let's see. Pete says, glad I was able to catch some of tonight's live stream. Hope to catch yeah. all of the next one. Thanks, Thanks you, for Pete. Um, and Allison, yeah, that makes me feel better. Yeah, Holly, Dawn is, it's just, it's a miracle. And it gets the penguins clean she after they She said she used laundry soap on. using mm -hmm. Dawn Borax and washing yeah. soda. Oh yeah, that would work. So. All, All right. right, we're going to have to let you go because yeah. I got like 5% left on my phone. <laughs> Before we just get cut off without being able to say goodbye. So, thank you so much for joining us. Yep. Um, we had a lot of fun. We should be back next week, I think. So, yeah. And again, as always, if you have anything that you want to chat about in a live stream, uh, come back after the live stream and leave a comment in the comment section and we can add it to our list. So have a good night, everybody. Thanks for, Thanks for joining us. Bye, Tammy. Bye, Holly.